us to present is uh, uh, Professor Walker, uh, Neil Walker, who's a uh, regular chair of public law and the law of nature and nations at Edinburgh University, where he also taught public law. Previously, he has taught legal and constitutional theory at the University of Aberdeen and at the European University Institute of Florence, where he served as Dean of Studies. He has held visiting appointments at Columbia, Cornell, Toronto, and Yale, and he is the author of 17 books, among which I would like to mention <coughs> Intimations of Global Law, Relocating Sovereignty, Sovereignty in Transition, and Europe's Area of Freedom, Security, and Justice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the for the invitation. It, it's great to be here, and uh, I've been involved in quite a few of these discussions already in in the UK and in my own country of Scotland, where obviously uh, there are many resonances with the uh, Catalan debate, and uh, uh, and I will try to maybe bring out bring out one or two of the analogous features in the, in the two situations. But I want to talk in particular about the, uh, the role of the EU. Uh, Juan said in his, his introduction that uh, uh, the, 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 the Catalan crisis was also to some extent a crisis for the, for the EU, uh, a point which Vincent also made. And of course it's, it's two ways because there's a sense in which what's happening now uh, does challenge the legitimacy of the EU, but equally the EU uh, we're asking the EU in some ways to, to sort of contribute to providing a solution to the, to the challenge of the legitimacy of the Spanish Constitution. So there's a two-way legitimacy question going on here, and uh, we have to look at that. I think it's interesting that right from the beginning, uh, certainly if you, if you live in other parts of Europe, the, 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 the rhetoric has been about escalation and de-escalation. These are the issues, these are the positions which uh, the, the, the terminology that people often uh, talk about. How do we de-escalate a conflict which seems to escalate so quickly? Uh, and the EU is often seen as, 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 a, as a party, as an entity which can help in that uh, de-escalation. And what I want to look at is the extent to which uh, that uh, possibility is, is, is likely to be, to be realized. So, what I've, written, what I've done here is just very, very basically uh, said, if we think about the relationship between the EU and sub-state nationalism, we can imagine uh, five different models, uh, five different ways of thinking about it. And they're in a kind of descending order of sympathy to the Catalan situation, if I can put it that way. So the first would be, the EU could be seen as a kind of sponsor of the rescaling of democracy in a way which was very, very sympathetic to and positive towards the Catalan situation. I'll say something about each of these. The second is what I would call constitutional engagement, where we're saying that without necessarily being a priori sympathetic to the situation, the EU could engage in full constitutional engagement with, with the situation. The third possibility is that the EU could be a kind of soft power broker. It could use its soft power in the situation to try to resolve matters. The fourth possibility is what I call conservative neutrality, where the EU stands back, leaves everything to the national authorities, and uh, doesn't intervene very much. And fifthly, the EU could actually be an active partisan, an active defender of the existing state interests. Okay. And I think a lot of people, certainly a lot of European lawyers and a lot of peop people with a European interest, certainly outside Spain, would have hoped that the EU's position would be probably somewhere between full constitutional engagement, which might be a little bit unrealistic, and at least being a soft power broker. Okay. The reality seems to be that the EU instead is somewhere between conservative neutrality and actually being an active defender of state interests. So I want to try to explain why that's the case and, uh, uh, and, and how we might move, move away from that. So let me look at each of these in turn. Uh, oh, sorry. No, that's... <laughs> okay, well done. 
Yes, okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so sponsor of rescaling of democracy. So this is, if you want to look at the, the Catalan situation, if you want to look at European law and European political project in a way which is opt optimistic towards some state nationalism, and I can say this because in the context of the Scottish independence uh, referendum three or four years ago, exactly the same sorts of arguments were rehearsed by, by Scottish nationalists. You can say, okay, let's look at the EU, the EU is a body which is committed to subsidiarity, which means that uh, democracy should take place at the lowest efficient level, which is often something which is in favour of units below the state. The EU should be, one of its fundamental values should be democracy, another should be liberty, a third, all in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, should be minority rights protection. We can also say, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the affirmation of self-determination, the European Court of Justice actually, for the first time ever last year, affirmed uh, the right of self-determination. Uh, it did it so-called obiter, it did it not directly, but talking about the significance of the right of self-determination uh, in other contexts, and said, of course, the European Court of Justice joins in the affirmation of this right of self-determination. And we also know, of course, that the EU has institutional structures which recognise, however inadequately, uh, levels of government below the state. We have a committee of the regions. We also have, perhaps more significantly, we've always had financial instruments, structural funds, regional funds, etc., etc. So there's a lot which can be said uh, in terms of the rescaling of democracy in terms of the EU. Okay? But of course, against that, there's, there are counter arguments. There is a democratic counter argument. The problem is that democracy as a principle doesn't tell us whether or not the relevant demos is Spain or the relevant demos is Catalonia. The democracy works two ways. There's also the legality principle, which we have in Article 2, again, of the Treaty of the European Union, and which the EU and the Spanish state has relied on very heavily here, regardless of the illegalities of some of their own actions. The, uh, the, the, the Spanish state does have, the, does have in many ways the, the constitution behind this. Now we can argue about the Spanish state's interpretation of the constitution, but there's a sense in which uh, actually existing as a, an a priori constitutional state for these purposes is actually very, very effective. And it also allows the Spanish state in some ways to, what I would call, commandeer its own constitution. Uh, we see all sorts of examples of that. We see you know, the way in which uh, uh, the, the different courts, the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court themselves, to some extent, are packed in favour of certain attitudes towards constitutional interpretation. We see it in the use of, uh, uh, one of the examples you gave, the, the use of quasi-legislative measures, for example, uh, changing the rules about uh, whether shareholders have to be uh, consulted before you change the, the legal address of a, of, of a company. All of these things are things which can be done within a constitutional framework. Constitutions work on the basis of there being a distinction between legislation, executive power, and judicial power. When you get situations of constitutional mobilization within states, often the boundaries between these different elements of the Constitution of blood and the way in which I would call constitutional commandeering. But it does mean that still, at least in some sense, the principle of legality can be on the side of the authority which has the power to do so. Beyond that, what we find in the Constitution, what we find within the EU also, is that we have a protection of national identity, including fundamental political and constitutional structures. And that is probably the most fundamental provision within the Treaty of the European Union, which instructs the EU to defend the status quo, or at least to recognize the status quo as it is. Because it does talk about protection of national identity. It does include fundamental political and constitutional structures. And it actually says, quite crucially, including local government. And the strong implication there is that you know, what has to be respected is the existing constitutional settlement 
uh, including the degree of centralization or decentralization, which is already enshrined within the Constitution. Also, the EU says that the state is responsible for essential state functions, and the EU should not entreat, intrude on these. And these essential state functions include territorial integrity and national security. So my point is that if we look at if we look at this in terms of the, the general principles, then there's a lots of values and lots of doctrines on either side of this. It's not an open and shut case. It's a very, very open-ended case. You know, lawyers could argue until the end of time about the extent to which the actual constitutional structure of the EU moves in one direction rather than another. There's all sorts of arguments being given to both sides. And actually, what, what you need to do beyond that is basically the EU, in a sense, it's, it's constitutionally underdetermined in terms of uh, the position on sub-state and Catalan nationalism. There is no obvious answer. Now, the real politic is that that isn't what happens. That's what's not, not what's happening within the EU at the moment. But you can imagine it would happen, it could happen. And I think that would have two sorts of consequences for the, for the Catalan situation in the moment. Now, constitutional theorists, when they talk about what a constitution is, they often draw a distinction between uh, jurisdictio, the idea that uh, basically the constitution should regulate matters of state, or matters of politics through law. It should constrain political power through law. And they also talk about gubernaculum that actually the Constitution should actually make that power in the first place. It should construct the political organs. You can imagine an EU which is more fully involved in constitutional engagement would do both of these. First of all, in terms of jurisdictio, you know, what you would have, what you might have is something which would be an enhancement of its existing rule of law mechanism. I don't have time to go into this at the moment in any great detail, but very, very briefly, the EU, in Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union, does have a rule of law mechanism which allows it to intervene in situations where there is a grave threat to the fundamental values, including legality itself, which we find within Article 2 of the DEU. So democracy, liberty, and legality, etc., etc. And the idea is uh, it can investigate where there's a grave threat and where it finds it finds that that threat is a real one and a continuing one, it can actually take measures, including ultimate me ultimately measures which would suspend the political powers of the parties involved. Now, the EU has never done this. In an earlier iteration, it always did so in Austria under Heider's Freedom Party a few years ago. But this is a mechanism which has developed over the years and it has not done so. So much so, that the Commission came out two years ago with a new rule of law mechanism which introduced a whole further set of stages before this formal stage, which would allow informal investigation to take place, etc., etc. And it's that further informal method which has been used in Poland uh, uh, in the context of the present constitutional crisis about the stacking of the constitutional court by the, uh, the government in Poland, and which has been threatened for Hungary. Okay, but only threatened for Hungary, never actually achieved. Now, what you find there is a situation where the EU is actually quite weak, is quite impotent. And part of its impotence has to do with the fact that the structures in place actually require uh, unanimity in order to achieve results. Okay? Uh, now, one suggestion which has been made is that there should be something like a Copenhagen Commission, which is vaguely uh, uh, modelled on the Venice Commission, which is something which exists under the Council of Europe, which is a, a different organisation. And the, the idea of the Copenhagen Commission would be that rather than this kind of one-off nuclear intervention, there should be an ongoing uh, monitoring of the democratic state of the member states over a period of years. Because at the moment what happens is that there's a kind of uh, uh, attitude of hands off, and then this nuclear option in, as an alternative to hands off. What there isn't is a sustained uh, activity, a sustained practice of overview of the uh, internal democratic mechanisms of the states. In some ways, that might seem an odd omission because this is something that the EU has always done in terms of enlargement. 
in terms of actually allowing new states to come in. Got it, you have these sorts of these sorts of procedures which take place over a number of years, etc., etc. So the EU has a track record in doing this sort of thing. But it's always done it for uh, in terms of conditions for entry, rather than doing it to to, to see whether existing member states are actually sustaining their own defence of the fundamental values of the EU. Okay. So that's not happening. Another thing which could happen is you can imagine they could have revised accession procedures in, in cases of uh, uh, internal enlargement uh, of some state nations. Now this was something which was a very live issue in the context of the Scottish referendum three or four years ago. Uh, the probably the most fundamental question which came up time after time, and remember the Scottish referendum took place far more peaceful conditions than the Catalan referendum did. But what we came up time after time is, what happens if we leave? What are the circumstances under which we get to join the EU? Will it be automatic? Will it be semi-automatic? Will there be procedural requirements? Will they require us to have a referendum? Will they require us to show that we have a just cause? Will it happen quickly? Will it happen slowly? Will we have to take our place in the queue? Will the Spanish government have the right to veto over us doing this? All of these sorts of questions arose. And one thing I can say is that the deep uncertainty was something which militated against the possibility of the success of the process. Okay? And that's something which has come back to haunt the UK again in the context of Brexit. You know, where a Scotland leaving, even in a situation where they would want to be the only part of the state which continued within the EU, even that doesn't necessarily get a positive response from the EU. Okay? So the point here, the point here isn't, isn't necessarily to be fundamentally critical of the EU, because what happens, what happened in the Scottish case is, uh, uh, we said then, wouldn't it be good if the EU actually had a general procedure you know, for this particular case? It's really, really difficult to develop a general procedure for the flip when the particular case is already upon you. Because procedures work better, procedures are far more easily developed in a more neutral situation. Uh, and of course, what we have again now, in the terms, in, in the context of the Catalan crisis, is a situation where the EU is not ready to respond at either of these levels. It doesn't have the mechanisms in place. Okay, uh, right. Very quickly, uh, soft power broker. So. This is probably the th you know many people who weren't thinking necessarily in terms of full constitutional engagement. Nevertheless, look at the EU's reputation for soft power, the reputation as someone which, which who, so as, as a body which promotes certain standards, has done so in terms of its own uh, enlargement program, has done so in terms of its neighbourhood policy program, etc., etc. The EU exhibits a lot of soft power, a lot of reputational power, to some extent financial power as well. And there was a lot of expectations here that the EU somehow would put themselves forward as honest brokers, as mediators of conflict. If they could be mediators of conflict in the context of Kosovo and in many other contexts, if they could offer their good services, their good offices in the context of Syria, etc., why could they not do so in the context of Spain? Why could they not do so in the context of the lone member state? <clears throat> and many people expected that they would get involved at this level. And of course, we know that this hasn't happened. That from very, very early on in this process, uh, the EU has effectively stuck its head under the table and said, we don't want to be involved in this. At no point has it uh, offered its services at no point has it suggested that it has a role to perform here, which is similar to the role that's performed in certain external context. At no far point has it said that uh, uh, has it invoked its broader culture of legality uh, to try to uh, to try to resolve the situation as well as the Spanish situation. It just hasn't done so. Okay, and uh, why not? Why not? Okay. Uh, Right. So part of the part of the reason here, I think, has to do with what I call conservative neutrality. Right? 
that the EU sees itself as deferring to existing national constitutional doctrines and realities. Okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be pro-state. What it means is that it's going to reflect what the national constitutional situation says. So, for example, in the UK, the EU effectively breathed a sigh of relief when the, EU, when the UK constitution proved to be flexible enough to allow referendums to take place in Scotland and also in Wales and previously, previous to that in Northern Ireland. And the EU could just sit back and say, OK, that's OK because that's allowed within the UK constitutional situation. Now, of course, that's actually quite rare. There are very, very few countries in the world which allow internal referenda. Vincent said that to some extent this is normal politics. That's correct, but actually constitutional politics normally does not allow, does not at least uh, explicitly allow uh, uh, a constitutional, uh, uh, does, not allow, does not allow secession. Uh, we have it in St. Kitts, we have it in Ethiopia, we have it in the UK, we have it in one or two other places. To some extent we have it in Austria, although it's not so clear there. But it's actually quite uncommon to do that. So the, the EU, in the context of Scotland, could actually sit back and allow constitutional reality uh, to, 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 to work itself out in a way which did not seem to be strongly in, in, in favour of state interests because, because, of the, because of the unusual flexibility of the UK constitution. And in some ways that was a big problem because it let the EU off the hook. It meant the EU did not actually have to make any, take any particular stance here in terms of that process. Then when it comes to the Spanish situation, and we have Article 2 of the Spanish Constitution, which talks of an indissoluble unity of the Spanish state, etc., etc., the EU metaphorically shrugs its shoulders and says the same thing again. It's up to what the national constitution says. We should not get involved in this. And in that situation, that has a far more conservative effect that because the Constitution itself does not allow this possibility. So there's a, a refusal, and of course, in addition to that, there's a refusal to anticipate accession prospects of new sub-state nations in the event of either unilateral secession or agreed dissolution. There's a kind of timidity there, uh, a, 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 an unwillingness to rock the boat, not to answer hypothetical questions. So there's a sense in which, on the one hand, they say, let's just see what the national constitutional structures say, and don't ask us hypothetical questions about what might happen tomorrow, because that might also be controversial. And also this tendency, I think, to treat both the methods and the outcomes as an internal state matter. If you look carefully at what the EU said in the first few days of the Catalan crisis, they kept saying, this is an internal matter for Spain. And it did not make it clear whether what they meant was whether or not there was a possibility of secession was an internal matter for Spain, or whether the methods that the Spanish government were making, were, 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 were employing to try to maintain the status quo was an internal matter for Spain. These are two quite different things. And there was a sense in which they talked about the two as if they were the same. They just said this is an internal matter for Spain. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me one to the final point. And I think, so I think the, whereas if I look at the Scottish situation, I think there the, the EU's position was very much one of conservative neutrality. They didn't say very much, they were very, very discreet, they kept their head out of it. Uh, they obviously didn't want the status quo to change but they didn't necessarily want to involve themselves in any position of political controversy beyond that. As I say, the Spanish situation looks different because it's the, the constitutional situation is so emphatically in favour of state interest. To be conservative there, to some extent, undermines neutrality because it is a sense in which you, you end up just defending the state interest. But I think beyond that, I think there's a, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why the EU can and to some extent does go further than that. There is this sense, I think, this strong sense that the EU is a club good rather than a public good, with states as a clubs, jealous of their own prerogatives. Okay? Again, going back to the Scottish situation, a number of times that any attempt to use any concept of public reason to explain what the EU was doing just didn't work. The, the, you know, the head of the Commission at the time, uh, uh, but also when he was still head of the Commission, 
would often say things like, well, it's not up to me. I can't decide what, what happened in Scotland. It's up to the member states. And some of these member states have secession problems of their own, like Spain, or like Cyprus, or whatever it might be. So there was this, this utter deferral to the idea that this is not a public good, but, it's a, but, but a club good. And the club members are what matters. There's also a lot of talk about the destructive institutional consequences of future enlargement. Uh, Juncker said, did he not, that he did not want to live in an EU of 95 states. So what he was talking about there was this fear of institutional sclerosis. That, and this is something which is quite a common theme within the EU, uh, post the Eastern enlargement. We moved from 6 to 9 to 12 to 15 and now to 28 members. But it's part of the Commission culture to say that that's already too many. So for God's sake, don't give us any more. Right? That's part of the argument which is used. And it was used explicitly by Juncker. There's also an argument which is, I think, deeper within EU constitutional culture, which claims that supranationalism makes new sovereignty claims both instrumentally and symbolically redundant. Instrumentally redundant because you have all sorts of European protections to fall back on, which actually, as we see, don't always amount to very much. But maybe also symbolically redundant because what you have in the context of the EU and part of the promise of the EU was that to some extent it was a post-sovereign entity. It was an entity which made sovereignty less significant than once it was. Okay? So part of the dream of the EU was that it would take it would take the tension out of the nationalist question. It would make the question of sovereignty and one which had less currency than it once did. And to some extent that's worked. You know, peace in Europe over 60 years is a fantastic dividend and it's at least something to do with the EU. But it's just not the case that it has made sovereignty irrelevant. In many ways it's actually encouraged sub-state nations like Catalonia or Scotland to think that they are sustainable entities. Fifty years ago, Scottish nationalism was berated by everyone as a kind of separatism. The Albania of the North, that was the argument which was used. And then after EU membership, no one talked about that anymore. So there's a sense in which symbolically, uh, EU membership on the one hand could be seen to, take, to, 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 to mean that uh, uh, sub-state nationalism is uh, uh, the, the claim for sovereignty is less significant than once it was. But actually what it also does is it actually gives a sense of feasibility, a sense of possibility to that. And clearly that's one of the things which is driving the, uh, one of the, things which is driving the Catalan situation. So let me just finish by saying that, that uh, I think uh, that, that combination of factors means that there is a culture within the EU and a culture within the Commission which has a potential for active hostility towards new status projects. I didn't think it was inevitable that that happened. But I think, you know, we have to say that looking at how the EU has responded over the last two months is that it has responded in a way which is disappointingly pro-state interest. And that was not inevitable. There's all sorts of forces within the EU which push in that direction. But it was a possibility for another way of thinking about it. But still is. But at the moment, the story is a disappointment.